I think um, we're absent a speaker, I'm afraid, um, but we might just get started and, uh, if necessary, change the order and have Naja join us during. Um, so first of all, um, and welcome to USIP this morning um, for this discussion of security of just and justice in post-revolution Libya. Uh, and welcome also to those of us, uh, or those who are joining us by webcast online. We had a very active conversation yesterday, my first anyway Twitter live chat, um, pulling apart some of the issues already. And we had Ambassador um, Deborah Jones and um, Ambassador Aaron from the UK, and, and a number of a huge number of Libyan civil society journalists and, and Libya followers from around the world. So I feel like we've already kind of gotten the discussion started, but. This morning, we'll do it a little bit more the old-fashioned way. Um, a couple of uh, things to start out with. Um, we have some good news and we have some bad news. Um, firstly, uh, our moderator also disappeared. Um, so I'm afraid that uh, the bad news is that you have me. I will be double-hatting double a little bit, setting out um, some of the introductory points and then handing over to the other panelists. Um, the good news, al although maybe it's bad news too, uh, is... <laughs> Is, is that we managed to rescue Naji from, from the clutches of a French airstrike, but now we've lost him in DC. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's, we, we are assured he's, he's on his way. Um, uh, what, in terms of order, what we were planning, although we may switch it around, is that I will start out by talking about um, some of the seeds that were sown for um, the current security and justice breakdown that come really from the Gaddafi era. Um, then Naji um, will talk uh, about where we are today in terms of perceptions of security and justice, um, and also how it's feeding into the current crisis. Uh, Christina will talk about um, some of the analysis points in that uh, in that security and justice breakdown in, in in the crisis and on some of the ongoing challenges in reasserting security and justice um, at state level. And then finally, we have Nejla here today, who's our um, former country director. Uh, used to be based in Benghazi and is now um, doing some study in America. She's going uh, to give some reflections from the perspective of a locally based lawyer, um, a civil society activist, and a major participant in the revolution. Um, so to put my presenter hat on and, and, and start out, um, as I said, I think you know, a lot of the time we skip into analyzing the security and justice situation in Libya without sort of going back to some of the, um, the legacy points of, of, of the Gaddafi regime and some of the decisions that were made in the immediate aftermath that have affected and contributed to this sort of overcrowded and chaotic security scene that we see today. Um, and much of the damage and the limitations of the security and justice institutions are rooted in Gaddafi era policies. Um, Gaddafi who systematically dismantled um, much of the central state institutional architecture and, and created sort of diversions of power to parallel structures which were most clo much more closely controlled. Um, and, and, and also created this sort of competitive and overlapping confusing set of functions in the security and justice realm, playing different ministries and different institutions off against each other, many thinking that they each uh, were carrying out a function which was sort of divided and perhaps also overlapping from another institutional perspective. Um, and, and going back in this sort of history point, I thought we might start look by looking at um, the military. Um, and the military, of course, is in, in ways how how Gaddafi, the, the tool that Gaddafi used to, to come to power. But subsequently, there was a coup attempt uh, and a number of power struggles with some of the people within his own um, uh, alliance. And so they, they sealed their fate. From then on, um, Gaddafi went about sort of systematically chipping away at their strength until really when the revolution hit, they were barely a shell, a very top heavy structure, which had lacked recruitment and funding for many years. Um, the MOD was essentially shuttered for a long time with Gaddafi personally controlling it. And, but then you had also this sort of parallel structure aspect where, yes, the military itself was weak, but of course there were some incredibly strong brigades, but those were much more tightly held. So, for example, the Khamis Brigade, which played a, an, an important role in the revolution as well. 
Um, looking then at the, the Ministry of uh, Interior structure and the police, um, the National Police was never strong. Um, and, and speaking to those who served as National Police before, they have this sort of inferiority complex, this notion that they were neglected, that they weren't really used. Um, during, during the Gaddafi period, again, there was this much tighter held uh, internal security structure and extensive intelligence networks. Um, though the police could carry out very basic functions like traffic management, basic um, criminal pr uh, processing of criminal low-level crime, um, the reality is that was because they, they held the upper hand in terms of force. And when that flipped during the revolution, um, there's been a sort of a, a loss then of that ability to even leave the station, such that police, when we interviewed them, essentially said, we're, we're here to, to take reports, but in order to effect arrests, we need to contact a Katiba. Um, um, there, there is this situation, of course, where you know militias and ordinary citizens now are much better armed than the police as well. And this, this split negative that the police themselves feel, um, both being seen as a tool of Gaddafi and yet themselves feeling that they were weakened by, by Gaddafi. Moving on then to, to look a little at the history of, um, of the justice system. Um, uh, in 1973, Gaddafi merged the secular and the civil uh, system, uh, the secular civil system and the religious court structure in order to create a sort of a hybrid. Um, this structure lay very much under the control of the Ministry of Justice with little independence. And although this actual this independence issue has structurally been corrected in the post-revolution period, unfortunately, because of the security situation, um, in reality, judges have not felt able to I exert that independence um, and have been very, very much inhibited and, and targeted. Um, there, there is a history of executive interference. Uh, in addition to executive interference in the basic way of going in and, and, and interfering with court rulings, there was also things like in 1981, Gaddafi uh, abolished the bar, essentially making all lawyers publicly salaried um, positions, um, removing competition, removing the sense of sort of merit and financial incentive that, that comes from a, a, a bar structure. And although that, that position was reversed in the 90s, many lawyers that we spoke to have said that it created like a sort of an irreversible damage to the reputation and the way that the, the way that the, that, that uh, profession operates. Um, probably more serious than that is the, the parallel um, courts that were set up, the people's courts. Um, and again, this was a, a parallel structure, much more tightly controlled by the regime, um, uh, disbanded, uh, but, on, but in ways, the practice that was operated, the special procedures that were operated in, um, in the people's courts have actually, in ways over the years, seeped into the regular practice, creating this sort of confused type of law being carried out by, by either structure. Um, in the post-revolution period, these uh, institutions fractured. Um, and it, particularly with the police and the military, many didn't fight particularly even with Gaddafi during the revolution, but in, stayed home or, or, or fought with the other side. There, one of the phenomena that, that has been observed in the post-revolution period then, though, is this localization of security and justice and a divergence between national level initiatives that have been attempted and what are the local level realities of the way that security and justice are carried out. And there's been very little, um, uh, and this is one of the major comments that we make in the report, it's been very little visioning or high level debate in this post-revolution period about what kind of system do you want? What kind of post, what after, you know, Gaddafi era, uh, the Gaddafi era has ended, and a vision then about what the future of security and justice in Libya should or will look like. Um, there's been very little mapping of that. Um, instead, what has happened is a sort of a, an ad hoc absorption of different militia groups into the system, anointing different militia groups as state entities without really con creating the control mechanisms, mechanisms necessary to truly bring them under the state. 
Um, and, and some of the actors that we mapped out in, and discussed in the report, in which Najee will give a bit of, more of an update on, are, um, for example, under the Ministry of, of Interior, though some of these have shifted over time, the Supreme Security Committee, the Anti-Crime Unit, the Libyan Revolutionaries Operation Room, the new diplomatic police, um, of course, and, and becoming very controversial in the current um, frame, the, um, the Libya Shield, um, uh, nominally under control of the Ministry of Defense, but I, I don't think any of us here would, would say that in reality that is the case. Um, and so you've got this sort of messy set of actors, none of which have been properly assigned separate roles. Um, and so as moderator, I suppose so that's sort of where I'll, I'll end, end setting up but to maybe throw out some of these themes for the, rest of the, for the rest of the panel, this idea that you have parallel and competing um, entities, but that they're both a feature of the post-revolution period, which sort of we've all been following, I think, but also a legacy point, um, and, 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 and now sort of repeating in the post-revolution period. And then this split between local and national um, in terms of... Uh, uh, level uh, control and actors and relevance um, for, for actors. And then this point about what is, what is the vision for security and justice going forward. Christina, I feel bad. You were supposed to have 20 more minutes, but. That's okay. I think, as we all know, if you work in post-conflict environments, flexibility is a huge asset. Mm -hmm. And so we will all hopefully um, sort of be able to use that here in Washington, D.C. as well. Um, so, you know, what we were hoping for is, you know, to have Najee present on where we are today. And so we'll add that sort of complexity in later on in the presentation. But it brings us to sort of the question of, what do we do now? And we've all been, hopefully, um, for those of you who've been following Libya, you understand sort of the complexity of the violence happening, particularly around Benghazi and around Tripoli, um, as well as down in Seba, and now moving even more westward to the um, border of Tunisia. And so the key question um, that you know I think we all really want to sort of have a conversation about once sort of we're all done presenting is how do we move forward what do we do to build rule of law in Libya how does the international community support Libyans to do that so what I'm gonna do is walk through a couple of different themes that sort of are both challenges um, as well as sort of observations of the security first um, in Libya then justice and then some sort of outlying points to sort of highlight so starting um, with the security landscape, I think that Fiona's point of these parallel, sort of the legacy of parallel structures is really an important one to note. In our presentation, we really highlight sort of the reality that this is quite negative in terms of rebuilding rule of law. And sort of what we found is there's, you can look at sort of both throughout the Gaddafi era and throughout post-revolution, and fortunately, even into today, there's sort of the reaction of how to build security institutions, let's just create new ones. And so what you're finding is sort of a number of different actors that are being given of legitimacy by the state, yet they don't have distinct roles and functions, and in reality, very few fall under the sort of de facto command and control of a state um, ministry. What we saw early on in the summer, which we thought was somewhat positive, is the anti-crime units were actually being sort of dismantled and fully put into the, um, the police directorates in um, each of the localities in Libya. And we really saw this as a positive sign of coalescing around sort of one state function that was providing law and order in communities in Libya. What we've been hearing over the past week, unfortunately, is sort of there anecdotally a number of different militia groups in particular, I think, are looking to actually reassert those anti-crime units um, because they don't feel like they actually control policing in their communities. And so, you know, I think it's a legitimate question to ask, why is it a problem to create these different functions? And so what we've really found is, first, it creates these multiple actors sort of with overlapping roles and functions, and honestly leaving significant gaps in providing law and order because nobody's sort of fulfilling everything. And then even more so, they're now competing against one another for power, for legitimacy, um, and one of the key questions, because often they're paid different salaries, is are they competing for sort of um, economic resources of the state? 
But sort of there's actually a second reason why we're even more concerned about this and why sort of some of the more recent conversations we've been hearing by different Libyans about sort of bringing back some of these different entities that in theory have been disbanded is that they're potentially going to be used as proxies for these national level conflicts that are ongoing. Um, I, you know, I think Naji can speak even more eloquently to this effect, but the reality is that if you have sort of a militia group that is asking to be anointed as an anti-crime unit because they don't trust the policing function, they feel the policing in their community is actually controlled by a different militia group, you're basically potentially having sort of these localized proxy fights for national level conflicts in Libya. Um, there is sort of a second, that's sort of the first theme, These how do we unravel these parallel structures that keep being created? The second theme is the fact that if you look at rebuilding rule of law and justice and security, unfortunately, very little progress to date has been made on institutional reform of the security system in Libya. Um, the, what we found is that the Ministry of Interior is incredibly bureaucratic heavy with a lot of different rules and regulations. You can, um, I think it's safe to say you could be sort of have to move through a number of different offices and yet never really get much change. Um, and unfortunately, there hasn't been a lot of sort of change management of these institutional um, functions in order to, I think, oversee the new sort of policing that Libyans seem to want. Um, sort of a fourth theme is that while there is, I think, a lot of problems um, on the security side in Libya, it's also important, and what we also try to do in our report, is to highlight where there are some successes. And so I think it's important to note, in terms of providing sort of law and order, there are some limited successes, and it's worthwhile potentially to try to do more to study why. Um, and so I'll just sort of point out a few. Um, First, the traffic police. The you know it's still a functioning entity. So, and I think some initial of our initial studies sort of found they have a very different legacy than most of the other police. But it's probably really important to better understand sort of their legacy, but why they're functioning, how they have a relationship with the community in which they're able to sort of sit out at traffic lights and not be um, attacked or sort of threatened. The second is and actually was highlighted during our Twitter chat yesterday, are some sort of community-based examples where they've been able to create functioning police. And um, the ones pointed out yesterday were Tobruk and Mizrata, um, in which the police are able to function without any interference from any armed groups. Um, you know, to the extent, and I will just say this, um, sort of putting it out there, we didn't study Tobruk, and so I, don't want to comment on it, but the comments yesterday through the Twitter chat were that the community was able to sort of work collectively and create their own plan of security um, in order to sort of have the police reassert themselves. And so these are opportunities to study, to better reflect and understand why they've been able to um, create sustained change, it seems, even in the face of some of the violence that's happening in the rest of the country. So sort of the last comment I'll make on the security side is I think as we've all unfortunately seen, um, there has been unfortunately no disarmament in Libya. Uh, I think after the revolution, there was sort of this hope, we have our final panelists. Um, I think there was hope that disarmament um, would be sort of achieved through integration of a lot of the armed actors. I think over the last six months, unfortunately, not only have we not de seen disarmament, what we've actually seen is um, rearmament and it's, what we found last year, which I think is sort of reasserting itself much more visually this year, is that most Libyans do have not felt the revolution is fully over, and they've felt that for now three years. And so one of the questions is sort of how do Libyans move forward in order to sort of fully um, come out of what they were fighting for in terms of independence in a new Libyan state. So that's sort of my comments on the security side. On the justice side, um, what we're still seeing today is that few courts are operating. If they are, they're doing sort of basic, very low level civil law, divorce, um, and those types of proceedings. By and large, justice actors have no security. A number have been targeted, assassinated, threatened. Um, in, there's also sort of a competing challenge for them in that the political isolation law 
it's very unclear how it's going to be fully carried out, and so this has caused a number of strikes in the justice system. What that means um, is that you're seeing significant prison overcrowding, and sort of while there were some initial gains on the prison side of the Ministry of Justice reasserting command and control of some of the prisons, um, most of that has unfortunately over the past few months reverted back to sort of militia or tribal control. What that leaves in terms of actual you know, justice mechanisms for Libyan people is unfortunately, um, or depends on how you look at it, self-help, vigilantism, um, sort of tribal dispute resolution, and religious leaders in the development of religious courts. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is more and more you're seeing people sort of comment on the role that tribal leaders can play. And one of the, so I thought it would be worthwhile just taking a moment to comment in terms of what we found in our research. Um, but I will also say that I, I think that this is one area that could use a lot more sort of anthropological type research to better understand sort of the roles, mechanisms, norms that are being utilized. But what we by and large found is that sort of tribalism in Libya um, is really very much a social connection, a social cohesion, and historically played that role. But and sort of following the revolution, what they've been doing, where there's been this justice vacuum and the lack of any mechanism to fully resolve a lot of the disputes, they've been trying to step in to quell the violence, very much sort of akin to a ceasefire. Um, but they aren't able to pro um, provide solutions to the root causes of a lot of the violence that's been occurring, particularly um, intercommunal violence. What's interesting is that, you know, Gaddafi really took a lot of measures to try to undermine the influence of tribes. Um, there's some really, really interesting anthropological studies from the 1970s that look at the role that tribes played, and that by and large, you know, the further you get away from sort of Gaddafi's strongholds, the um, more they may play a role. But by and large, there's no sort of historical customary norms that you find in a lot of sort of tribal justice systems to deal with crime. Um, and it's just really important to note, such as how to address homicide and murder. Um, and so, and then the last thing is, as we talk to a lot of these tribal leaders, what they've said is they don't want to step in to play the role of the state in creating justice. What they want is to have peace, and so they're trying to do anything they can um, in the interim measures. But what they wish is what they wish to see is sort of a um, neutral, you know, functioning state justice system. And I think that that's sort of an important lesson actually for the broader um, Libyan people, which is what we've by and large found, which is they have a desire for the state to be providing justice and security. Um, and so it's just sort of a question for all of us to reflect, have we missed that window of opportunity to try to sort of galvanize around that desire? Um, and if we have, like, how do we maybe um, reopen it? Sort of my last thoughts really are also sort of that a number of the challenges that we're seeing overtly as justice and security challenges are underlying that are political, social, and economic issues. I think that there's been significant attention given to the political and social challenges, um, but what we're often forgetting are sort of these economic challenges, the fact that a lot of um, sort of the youth bulge need economic resources, and so it's just, you know, something that has had little progress, particularly in terms of diversifying Libya's economy, but also sort of trying to make sure that the oil fields are reopened. And there's a bit of a chicken and an egg, but I just throw that out there that sort of to be cautious about trying to put rule of law um, solutions on sort of political, social, and economic problems. OK. Um, so we now welcome uh, Anaji, who we have located in the grid of Washington, DC. Um, we see. tried to explain the grid last night, but <laughs> apparently failed. Um, let me just pull up his presentation really fast. Why is it not going down? Maybe just click on the PowerPoint, was it? Um, yeah, but it's not opening. Okay. Technical difficulties. In our defense, 
lawyers are generally really bad at using technology. <laughs> so please work with us for just a minute. No problem. Oh, okay, it's frozen. Maybe I'll grab AV. But just to, to, to introduce Naji, Naji is one of Altai's consultants um, based in Libya. Um, he's been working um, on research on perceptions of security justice, security providers, uh, Islam um, for the UK and the US governments. He's traveled very widely um, within Libya and has access to many Thuar and political groups. Um, Naji is a fluent Arabist, uh, has a master's degree in law and international security from Sciences Po. Um, and is also a founding member of the Paris-based think tank, Noria. Um, let me just see if I can get this PowerPoint to work. Oh, there we go. There... very much Fiona and good morning everybody and thank you for being here sorry for the delay again uh, it's not very difficult to find your way in Washington but for me it was a bit complicated this morning so, um, so I'll be mainly talking about the um, effects of the current political crisis on the security sector in, um, in Libya um, today and so the, the, the main uh, topics I'll be um, I'll be talking about, before digging into the security sector uh, aspect of things, it's a brief introduction about the political landscape in Libya today, uh, the political strategies and their impact on the security sector, their impact more ex precisely on the local security sectors, their impact on the legal security actors, and uh, the question to know whether uh, the current political crisis is an opportunity for Salafi policing actors to emerge in Libya. And, of course, the uh, uh, ever-awaited question about the jihadist momentum in Libya today with all the uh, jihadist movements uh, thriving in the region. So, first, the political landscape in Libya. And um, actually, I'm here uh, trying to describe the two uh, camps that are emerging in Libya today. Uh, the so-called Islamist revolutionary camp, which is a heterogeneous alliance between uh, cross-national Islamist coalitions. And here we're talking about uh, parties like the uh, um, Muslim Brotherhood branch of the um, Libyan Muslim Brotherhood of Shoot, which is the Justice Construction Party, or the former LIFG uh, uh, members who founded their own parties which are allied actually with local uh, communities and local tribes, notably in um, Misrata or in Zawiya or in Sabrata uh, and other uh, locations, of course. Um, however, despite this Islamist outlook, the, the main uh, political power of, these, of this coalition relies on local legitimacies and mainly legitimacies that is driven from three different from the support of three different groups. The first ones are the Karagla, which are from Turkish origins, Turk Arabs. Um, and they are mainly based on the coast in Misrata, in, um, in Zawiya, uh, Sabrata, in Benghazi and Darna. Uh, the, other, the second group is mainly tribal or sub-tribal groups that were major marginalized under uh, the former regime and who perceived the revolution as an opportunity to improve their share uh, and, and their, uh, their role in the, in the political process, economic uh, process in Libya. Uh, for example, we can talk here about Aulad Suleiman in Sabha, who uh, perceived uh, the, re the revolution as an opportunity to counter the influence of prominent tribes that, were, that had constituted the social base of Gaddafi's regime, like the Gaddafi or the Warfalla. Adding to these two categories, we have ethnic minorities such as the Amazir in Zwara, who are allied today with Misrata, um, as opposed to the Zintanis. So it's a circumstantial allies, but it broadened the uh, the uh, the social base of this Islamist revolutionary camp. Uh, why Islamist? 
uh, actually the, 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 the main idea here is this camp rely, uh, bases its support on local communities, but its leadership is incre increasingly Islamist because it's, it, there is always a good, um, it's, it's, it's a vector of legitimacy, this religious outlook, and also it is for some an opportunity to uh, obtain regional support from, um, from some countries. Um, within this Islamist and broad Islamist uh, spectrum, some jihadist elements do exist and are taking an increasing role, especially within this context of uh, polarization. Um, the second camp is the inst institutional conservative camp. Uh, it's a bit of a technical word, but anyway, it is as heterogeneous as the, uh, the, f the, f the former one. It is composed uh, of the, the so-called honorable tribes that constituted Gaddafi's social base in, this, in the west and in the south of Libya which is uh, circumstantially allied with a Saudi tribal alliance in the East. Um, these tri Eastern tribes actually did participate in the revolution, but are, are afraid of being um, marginalized in the current process, notably by, in their point of view, Islamist uh, forces or Misrata-backed forces in the East. So they are, they, they uh, participated to the same conference called Lib uh, Libyan uh, Tribes Conference in May 2014 that actually constituted kind of a momentum um, for a new camp in Libya, a new alliance between Eastern and Western tribes that were uh, actually not in very good terms under, under Gaddafi. Um, their popular constituencies are mainly tribal, uh, adding to them some uh, military officers mainly coming from the same tribes uh, but who else have this uh, worry of preserving the privileges within the military establishment? Um, it also includes independent figure and civil society activists. Institutionalists, because actually the deep state in Libya today, and despite the revolution, is still uh, dominated by these tribal elements, um, even if some changes did occur at the leadership level. Uh, and this is one of the main uh, subject of conflict between the two uh, the, the two camps. Uh, we can talk about this subject for um, for hours. So, just a quick uh, geographical repartition of the two uh, camps, actually. Um, and the, the the problem is in Libya today that most localities outside big cities like Tripoli, Benghazi, and Sabha are have very strong political identities, and this is fueling uh, political tensions and intertribal tensions. There is no place for pluralism within these cities, actually. Um, representative bodies, which are local councils, <coughs> civil society institutions, and uh, brigade leaders, very in most cases, share the, the same cause and the same interest. So. We can uh, take the example for exa of, uh, of Tobruk, uh, which is a tribal constituency mainly w where the population is mainly composed of tribal elements. Uh, but Tobruk hosts um, a community from, from Misrata, and the community from Misrata settled in Tobruk uh, from at least half a century had to issue a communique lately to declare its support to the House of Representatives and to deny any any links with Misrata. So there is a kind of local dictatorships being uh, um, implemented across the, the territory where there is no real uh, room for, uh, for plur pluralism. Um, as well, security actors actually are suffering from, from the same syndrome where most security actors, when we know they're coming from one particular city, are associated with the city and have a very clear political identity, which prevent them from uh, doing policing, uh, fulfilling policing activities outside their areas of, uh, of origin. So, um, as of today, uh, three different uh, vectors of legitimacy uh, are, are, uh, are structuring one security actor's identity in Libya. 
the local legitimacy seems to be the most important one. And Libyans tend to trust local groups and personal connections as to provide security services. Um, the second uh, vector of leg legitimacy, and this is according to the survey conducted by Altai Consulting in collaboration with USAP in June 2014, uh, is the legal legitimacy in a sense that Libyans are still very eager to see a national police being uh, reinforced or at least established in certain in certain areas. Um, aware of this, post-revolutionary actors are trying to um, to endorse this legality label and to have. Uh, the monopoly over the legal use of, of violence in Libya. Here we're talking about groups like the Libyan Shield Forces, the Supreme Security Committee, which was uh, created in 2011 as a gathering of different uh, revolutionary brigades to uh, do uh, policing activities, actually, and was disbanded in 2013. However, uh, the groups that belong to the Supreme Security Committee still exist today, still respond to the Ministry of Interior, at least nominally, and pretend to operate in the name of the law and to respond to the Ministry of Interior, which Ministry of Interior is the one in Tobruk or uh, in Tripoli. This is an, another layer as well. The third uh, vector of legitimacy, actually, these groups are trying to um, to market is the religious leg legitimacy. We know Libya is a very conservative society where Salafi ideas uh, are very popular. And here we're not talking about jihadist Salafi idea. We're talking about more Kiyati Salafi ideas, more in line with the Saudi school of Salafism. Um, and actually, the the, the um, in, in a society that was traumatized by the uh, by the revolution, where the youth is hardly controlled by the elders, uh, Salafi is a very good option for many uh, tribes in Libya as to accept people with at least in good public morality, uh, with strong uh, using the the hard way to impose public order in cities that were particularly divided. Uh, by the revolution. Here we're talking about cities like Sirt or Darna that were um, deeply divided uh, during the revolution between tribes which supported the regime and others that supported Gaddafi. Um, these uh, actually uh, Salafi groups are developing a very uh, interesting discourse about Islamic unity beyond the revolutionary fault lines uh, that are actually used by most of the revolutionary or anti-revolutionary actors. So um, this is how they succeeded to impose themselves even in tribal uh, areas like, uh, or cities like Sirt. Um, so the, the, how, the, the question is today how the current um, political crisis had impacted actually uh, the security situation, and more exactly, local policing actors. Um, as you can see on the graph here, um, the the most popular option for Libyans to be to, as a policing actor is the community itself, uh, after no one, of course. And we can see as well that a local brigade um, uh, popularity or role uh, per, perception of role has substantially increased from 3% in 2013 to 12% in 2014. It tells a lot about the increasing role of local actors uh, in Libya. Um, however, in the problem is today with the new strategy of territorial expansion of certain brigades, uh, notably with the operation down of Libya, um, certain areas are actually emptied from these local brigades which were in charge of security. And we are facing in Tripoli, for example, an increasing risk of, um, of security vacuum um, that, is, that will be hardly actually uh, filled by the new de facto forces present in Tripoli. Um, Misrata is trying actually to uh, to play an interesting role uh, today in, in Tripoli and in the West in general. And some observers did call it the Pax Misrata, which is a new um, 
order, a new peace in the West and the South of Libya, um, where Misrata will try to impose a certain political solution to competing communities. And here we're talking about Bani Walid and Warshafana. Um, and many actually signs were given by the heads of down of Libya forces to reassure these uh, communities. Uh, it is not guaranteed that these, this strategy will work considering the importance that give Libyans to local actors and their distrust to, toward any uh, what they call foreign actors or at least not, origin, not from the same origins as they are. Um, I will talk here about the particular case of, uh, of Tripoli. Um, and actually, in Tripoli, we can see very clearly the impact of having local uh, groups that are, um, that have social, co that, that belong to the community they protect. We have two, um, two cases that are interesting. I, I will not uh, talk about all the info or, that are on this slide, but two cases are, uh, are worth noting. Souk al-Jum'ah is reputed for being the most secured neighborhood in Tripoli. It is guarded by a, a Salafi brigade, which members are uh, inhabitants of Souk al-Jum'ah and belong to the social uh, <coughs> tissue of Souk al-Jum'ah. Um, on the contrary, in, in, uh, in cities like, in areas like Abu Slim, Salah Hadin, Qasr bin Ghashir, perception of, of security are, le are less positive. And even though actually the, um, the brigades that are in control of these areas are as well Salafi and have Salafi credentials. But the explanation here would be the fact that uh, the, per the personalities in charge of the brigades in um, these areas, Abu Slim, Salah Din, and Qasr bin Ghashir, uh, belong to, uh, to uh, communities that are not uh, that do not constitute the majority of the population in these areas. Qasr bin Ghashir, Salah Din, and Abu Slim are populated with, with tribes that were loyal to Gaddafi. And they perceive the new brigades in charge, the revolutionary brigades, are being intruders or at least n do not benef benefit from the uh, required legitimacy from their uh, point of view. The same scenarios. Uh, will likely to happen again uh, today uh, with Misrata controlling brigades, despite the fact that Misratan brigades are trying to control their elements to uh, play um, a relatively posi positive role in reassuring the different communities, as mentioned earlier. However, um, repeated clashes were reported lately, uh, even between Misrata and their allies in uh, Tripoli, like in, um, in Souk al -Jum ah or in Fashloum. Um, so here again, um, the, 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 um, the down of Libya operation is, could threaten the, the local um, security mechanism that were implemented uh, over the last three years and may, 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 may disturb, in a sense, the social order and security order uh, in, in Tripoli. Um, now we'll, we'll talk about actually, um, maybe I'll, I'll we're, we're short on time or it's, it's fine? It's fine. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the impact of the current crisis on the legal policing actors. And here we're talking about the national police and the national army. But before talking about that, we'll maybe talk about the struggle over the security sector uh, reform. Um, security sector reform in Libya, and how both operations, Down of Libya and Dignity Operation, aim at controlling the legal uh, security sector. Each party is, as of today, claiming to detain the monopoly over the legal use of violence. So uh, what are the arguments of the Islamist revolutionary camp? Uh, first, a distrust toward the security institutions, most of which were involved in the repression campaigns in the 80s and the 90s. Um, when we talk to some young um, brigade members in Benghazi or in Misrata, they will always refer to a parent, a br big brother, who was a victim at one moment uh, of these repression campaigns. And so there, there is this dimension. The Egyptian scenario 
did actually um, create a, a certain paranoia among uh, uh, the Islamist revolutionary in the, within the Islamist revolutionary camp, um, and eager actually to preserve a certain military means in their hands as to protect their interests facing maybe what they perceive as hostile security institution. Here we're talking about the Libyan National Army and the National Police. Um, also, there is another, uh, there is an additional argument that is being brought by certain Islamist elements, uh, Islamist milieu, in, uh, notably in the East, is accusation against uh, notably Haftar affili affiliated forces of continuous um, exaction. They report to uh, random checkpoints, kidnapping of Islamist element. So this is the kind of element they will br bring to justify their, their will to preserve their military structures. Uh, sorry. Uh, also, the inefficiency of the integration strategy is an additional uh, uh, is an additional argument. Most um, most Islamist and revolutionary actors do refer to the fact that uh, well, the integration strategy is not working well, and mainly due to the lack of will of those who are in charge um, of integrating me in a meaningful way a revolutionary commander into the. Ad into the milit security struct uh, sector structure at a leadership le level. Um, on the other side, the, on the institutional conservative camp side, um, also they have a lot of arguments. The shadow of, of Islamist terrorism and, um, and indeed many of the security institution serving officers have participated in the events during the 90s and the repression of the ex-LIFG members uh, so they still have the same, maybe, state of mind regarding these uh, regarding this person. Uh, another argument is the assassination campaign against security and military officers. Uh, and one must say that there is no, as of today, like material proof of who is behind the assassination. But the political aim seems to be very clear in the mind of. Uh, on the mind of the security military officers interviewed in, in Benghazi. There was a, a, a triggering event, actually, which was the assassination of Abdel Fattah Yunus, the chief of staff of the Libyan rebellion in July 2011, by some is extremist Islamist element. And at that moment, the, the mutual distrust, had, since, since that moment, the mutual start has only increased between bo both camps, and each camp was trying to build up its own military uh, institutions, uh, bodies, and independently from, uh, from the other. Uh, another argument, and here when we talk mainly with the serving officers as a middle management level, is the incompetence of revolutionary elements that are not enough trained and so there is kind of uh, corporatism that is motivating serving officers, at least those who were serving under the former regime, um, actually motivating them to reject any new elements, uh, revolutionary elements. The SSR mismanagement as well created a lot of frustration in the sense that actually many revolutionary which were much more paid than uh, policemen or uh, soldiers, and this is something policemen did complain about um, at many at many occasions. Um, and of course, uh, the last argument, but one of the most important, is the accusation against the Islamist revolutionary camp of willing to implement a substitution strategy. Um, this is something that was mentioned indeed by uh, uh, some of the uh, Islamist revolutionary camp leadership. Um, and uh, and with the idea, notably of the National Guard, which which had a name to to create a reservoir for a new national army to replace the existing national army uh, in Libya. So um, these these are the main arguments of actually the two camps that are today um, making any security sector reform uh, approach exclusive of the of the other camp in the in the in the. In, in the point of view of each of the two camps, actually. Um, so, yeah. We have an interruption question. Sure. Before we go on to the next slide, I just have a question about the inefficient integration strategy. We were talking about a lack of will. Um, is that from the militia commanders from the institutions that are trying to um, integrate them, the former WAC and, and the acronym now, or, or both? 
f from the uh, Islamic revolutionary camp point of view, it's mainly the uh, military and police and, and national police uh, institution uh, reluctance to integrate any uh, elements, notably at the, at the leadership uh, level. They integrated nominally a lot of uh, revolutionaries, but it remained uh, without effects at uh, mo most of the times, actually. Um, so as of today, for both camps, whether dignity operation or down of Libya operation is how to control the security sector. This is one of the main objectives. Um, because both camps are aware that benefiting from a legal mandate would offer to, the, to, the, to, to, uh, to their detainers the possibility to enhance their acceptance by a population, by the population. Um, as revealed by this graph here, the Libyan population is still very keen to see the national police in charge of security, and the national army as well. Um, so having this legal mandate would, of course, facilitate um, the acceptance of the different security actors by the different populations, especially when these, secu these security actors are operating outside their areas of origin. This is the case of Misrata and Tripoli, and this is the case of uh, um, Misrata playing a, a kind of a role in Sabha as well. Um, Haftar in Benghazi, he's not from Benghazi originally, so having this legal label is determined for all of them actually. Um, and actually, we're, we're trying, to, we're starting to see the consequences of um, of this down of Libya operation, dignity. Uh, but military failure is preventing them from implementing any uh, meaningful uh, reforms. But uh, down of Libya, after their control of Tripoli, they're trying to reform the security sector, or at least the national police in Tripoli, in a way that is in line with their interest. Um, so we know that many uh, a series of nomination uh, did occur in Tripoli, and we were taken by the minister, Ministry of Interior uh, following the uh, the victory of down of Libya operation in Tripoli, um, several police stations, notably in areas that were under the control of um, Zintani affiliated brigades, were taken over by um, forces that were considered as being closer to the down of Libya operation. Here we're talking about Salafi, the Irnewa brigade that was operating in Abu Slim and took over the police station in Ghut Sha'al. Uh, and an Amazigh brigade that took over the control of Al Andalus police station. Uh, both police stations are actually very strategic in a sense that both police stations did benefit uh, from uh, the international community's support and police uh, training uh, programs. So I think there, there is a, um, a very um, clever strategy behind these, uh, these different moves. Um, in addition to uh, the impact on the legal policing actors, and we can see the limits of both uh, actually vectors of legitimacy. The first one is the local one. Very clearly, brigades operating outside their areas of control cannot rely on the vector of local legitimacy and will need to, re to rely on local groups. And the legal uh, vector is also disputed as the legality, boundaries of legality in Libya are still very, very vague. So here intervenes actually the religious uh, vector of legitimacy and notably uh, the, the Salafi one. And this actually um, relies on the fact that um, Salafi ideas are very popular in Libya. And notably, uh, this is a, a USAID study uh, that was conducted by Altai Consulting in January 2014, and uh, actually, which allows to to um, to uh, measure, which allowed to to measure the, the the popularity of the Salafi ideas, and notably through, for example, a certain number of examples. But uh, one question is: Was do you agree with the creation of the of the Promotion of Virtue and Combat of Vice Committee, which is uh, um, actually based on a Saudi model of religious police, and that was marketed 
at one moment by certain forces in, uh, in Libya. And actually, we can see that at least 65% per, uh, of Libyans do support uh, in a very strong way uh, this initiative, and up to almost 70% support it. Um, I think, yeah, 20%, uh, additional 20% support it uh, relatively. Um, so, aware of this reality, many brigades actually did uh, develop a certain Salafi outlook and espouse Salafi ideas. Um, and here, confusion, conf we should not make the confusion between Salafi Kedis groups and jihadist groups that are mostly considered as being deviant by most uh, Libyans according to the same uh, uh, survey. And actually, um, these Salafi groups are uh, succeeding to impose themselves, notably in communities that were uh, particularly divided during uh, the revolution. And we take, we, we'll, take, we'll talk here about CERT, uh, where uh, following the uh, liberation of CERT uh, in uh, late uh, 2011, um, some brigades from Misrata and Benghazi did form an SSC uh, unit in, in CERT, um, but the SSC unit with strong revolutionary credentials. In 2012, actually, the unit had to leave CERT following the pressures of certain local tribes, and actually operated the same elements, operated the return in CERT uh, starting mid-2013 under a new label, which was the, uh, prom uh, the uh, promotion of virtue and combat of vice community had completely different uh, discourse, not referring at all to the revolutionary uh, discourse, uh, more uh, talking about public morality, Islamic unity, and uh, this, this kind of terminology. And actually, Ansari Sharia, uh, while they used this promotion of virtue and combat of vice community at the beginning, came uh, unveil the real identity shortly uh, afterward by uh, July 2013. Um, we, we can see on the picture here, and this picture was published by a Raya Media Group, actually, uh, which is affiliated to Ansar al-Sharia, where they uh, conduct social awareness campaign in, the, in schools and uh, and provide different kind of, uh, of social services. Actually, in many aspects, the jihadist uh, dimension of Ansar al-Sharia uh, in, in cities like Sirt, Sabrata, or, um, or even uh, certain areas around Tripoli is, is uh, exaggerated to a certain extent, uh, unlike the case maybe in Benghazi or, uh, or in Darna. Um, these, uh, like, these, these uh, organizations are taking benefit from the support that is offered by the population to uh, Salafi groups in general. Um, so I will go a little bit faster. So here we're, 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 we, were, we were talking about the Salafi groups, and indeed there were a number of Salafi, Salafi groups operating in a very efficient way in Tripoli. And Souk al for example, which where we, we saw that the population had a very positive perception of security, the movement, the, the, the special deterrence force in charge is, has Salafi leaning. Um, so what about the jihadist threat everybody's talking about today uh, in Libya? There is, of course, a, some jihadist organizations operating in Libya. And actually, we saw, like it is the case of Ansar al-Sharia, not only in Serbia, but also in Ghazi, we, we moved from a, st a stage of uh, sh charity association to uh, late September, a Derna-based group with this Islamic Youth Shura Council uh, that um, uh, announced its allegiance to ISIS uh, lately. Um, so s several several dynamics are actually today structuring the evolution of jihadist movements. First, they are gaining uh, growing autonomy vis-a-vis -vis their former revolutionary allies, and um, and here we're talking, for example, about some Islamist uh, mainstream parties in Benghazi. We're talking about some uh, tribes in the in the south, like Aulad Sulaiman, who might have seen an opportunity to gain 
additional support by allying themselves to some jihadist groups. And now the jihadists are taking increasing economy, uh, autonomy in, uh, in the south. Um, also, they are increasingly violent toward their competitors. In Darna, um, many clashes were reported between Ansar al-Sharia of Shud, which is the Shura Islamic, Islamic Youth Shura Council, and the Abu Salim Martyrs Brigade, which is a revolutionary group. Um, I think, as of today, our best chance to combat uh, the jihadist um, elements in, in Darna uh, under the command of Salam al-Darbi, and which, to a certain extent, benefits from a local legitimacy, unlike maybe the, sh the, the, the Shura Council. Um, the, the, the jihadist movement are looking to expand their territorial control as well, and we can see a, a number of locations, Tripoli, Sabahajan, Zur, Zawiya, and Sabrata. And for the first time, Ansar al-Sharia has made public its presence in Libya, in, in Tripoli, sorry, <coughs> late August 2014. However, maybe the, the only good news in this uh, different elements, is, unlike uh, the Islamic State in Syria, Jihadist movement in Libya are mainly composed of local elements who are, at least in their public discourse, eager to preserve a certain, certain links with their local communities. Um, of course, if the situation continue to, the, 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 the fighting continue to, uh, to exist in Libya, it will be very difficult to contain the jihadist uh, elements. So uh, I think the, the, the ceasefire that was uh, declared yesterday may be, may be a good news uh, that will maybe at least prevent these kind of jihadist movement of um, growing in Libya. Thank you for uh, your attention. It was a bit long. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sanazi. Um, and now finally, um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, our final panelist, uh, as I mentioned, Nejla is uh, our former country director in Libya. Um, she's also a professor of criminal law at Benghazi University, a former lawyer in Libya, Libyan activist, uh, and a practitioner in restorative justice. Uh, at the moment, she's um, studying conflict transformation at Eastern Mennonite University as a Fulbright scholar um, and continues to provide a lot of support for our justice and security work. Hello, um, thank you uh, for this uh, presentation, Naji, and also Fiona. It's very actually significant report, and I think it uh, highlights a lot of many aspects. And uh, what I like about, about the support, uh, the, the report actually, it's really uh, highlight the causes of the conflict and try to analyze the political aspect uh, of the situation in Libya. Uh, it seemed a little bit dark uh, and. Uh, and mess, but we know the conflict and the post-conflict area where we have this legacy we 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 uh, carry in our shoulders as a Libyan now. Uh, it's a huge issue how we think about how we can transform this legacy in a way will be, uh, you know, solve that uh, conflict because really we need to think now. Okay, after uh, that, all that analysis, what the solution now? What we can do? And there is no one answer for that. Uh, and uh, it's not easy also answer, but uh, definitely there is no possible. And what really I want to encourage everybody here as a policy makers and as a donors and as a practitioner, we should think about creative way to solve that conflict. We need to think about how we can really, uh, you know, use mechanisms, maybe very simple mechanism uh, as an international community, as people who believe in peace, and we need really to support uh, what's going on in Libya in a way we can uh, reduce that conflict. So uh, there is many things in my mind, but first of all, I, I would love to start with uh, this legacy can be transformed in a way we can really see significant change. And now by mentioning the traditional leaders several times, and there's a huge difference between the religious leaders who try to use the political issue as umbrella and between the traditional leaders who really promote the social uh, coherent to the society. Now we have a, 
a big division in the Libyan society between who support the dignity and who support the down, who support the parliament in Tobruk, who support uh, the members in Tripoli. And that really, really, it's, it's, it's a dangerous sign because one of the things we rely on as a Libyan is the social coherence. And this is was the things really every, even when we went through the conflict, when the old days and the revolution, it was one of the things really support everything. So I'm thinking now how we can do that. I think the problem solving approach is one of the things we should focus on as a practitioner, as a policy makers. Uh, lack of, you know, lack of information, lack of awareness and education, it's one of the issues now we, we're facing in Libya. Trauma also, the trauma, as Neshi mentioned, the trauma with the youth, the trauma with the, Lib with the Libyan who support the revolution from the beginning until now. Uh, really, it's, 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 it is one of the obstacles now to reach the, the, the population there, to try to encourage them, because everybody just stuck in one place in the circle of violence, everybody disappointed. Um, most of the activists I know, I know like flee outside the country now because they start threatened by uh, different groups with different agenda. So Tunisia now, more than two million Libyan people now in Tunisia, and double that number now in Egypt. Okay, we now find a way to try to reach those people, try to, uh, you know, train those people. Try those people really seeking help. Like I have a friend of mine, they just keep asking me if we can just communicate with some international organization, they can provide support and help. We need to just train ourselves in a way when the country will be more secure, we can go back and then train the people. So you can have the solution to, prov to, to train uh, local expertise have the capacity to help, you know, what's going on in this security. Rule of law and security, it's, it's, it's a big obstacle also because we have lack of institution, uh, we have uh, biocratic systems, we have people deal with old mentality. So how we can change that? I mean, um, the, one of the things I was like reading about North Island when they have the issues about the police, and, 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 and they, they can sit together as a police and as a traditional leaders and prosecutors and lawyer together in groups and ask questions what we need, what, what, what's, what, what will bring justice for us, and how we can you know, think about a way, how we can s support this, uh, the, uh, the, the, secu the security sector in our ground, in, in, our, in our countries, in our cities, in our community. And there is actually many signs that happens now in Libya. Like I was in conversation with one of my friends yesterday, and there is uh, there is traditional leaders actually trying really to reach the the, the wise traditional leaders, really try to reach uh, some lawyers. Uh, in one of the neighborhoods in Benghazi and try to bring them together and say, hey, what we can do as a community now? How we can face these challenges without being threatened or ki killed? And this is actually a sign of hope for me. And the people have passion, and the people really, really seeking help and really need support, but they don't know how they can do that with the security issue. So this is one of the things. The other thing about the traditional leaders, the traditional leaders actually, they have a negative and positive a aspect. The, the good thing, they really have the power and the moral and the respect really to, to sort the conflict. But it's just for short term. How we can make that process more healthy and create sustainable, sustainable peace? We can do that through training those traditional leaders with some group of the civil society, the principles of, about restorative justice, and we have that already in our religious. But unfortunately, we just focus, you know, people try to use now the religious in a bad way and try just to ignore all these principles and values we already have and, we're, and, and, and it was really one of the solution for many countries uh, in the world, like Somalia land, like Kenya. I have a conversation, interesting conversation, with one of the traditional leaders there last week, and really they do great work there in sorting the conflict and try to implement many um, uh, principles in terms of trauma healing and restorative justice. So why we can't support that as an international community? Why we can't think about that to provide capacity, that capacity can really support in long term the security reform? I mean, as a lawyer, really, what my 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 first attention will be, you know, the rule of law, and 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 I was really struggling with the corruption in the in the, in the legal system in my country. 
But how we can reach that, how we can fill the gap now if we don't have governments capable to provide strong institution? We know governance and we, need, we, we know the rule of law and, and, the, and, and how you create healthy institution, it takes years. But we, to be able to do that, at least we can have people, can believe in that, can help us to push very hard to create change. And it's not easy for me to come today and speak about change. I lost my mentor this summer, Selwa Bukagis, assassinated. He she was the first woman I saw when I went to the court. And I lost also one of the beautiful you know, youth uh, in my city, Benghazi, just last week, Tawfiq. Uh, Tawfiq uh, bin Saud, and it's not easy to speak about peace and hope and how we really cre create a change. But really, I'm coming today because really I believe those people have pas passion and they die for a reason. And we should fight. This is our battle. This is, I, I believe also the change should be come from the Libyan people, but also we need support in that. How we can work as insider and outsider together <laughs> to create sustainable peace in Libya. There is many ways for that. And I think you know m better than me in the way how we can create that. But I'm just giving you examples and just thoughts and ideas. Just encourage each other. And I think this is the critical moment now to support the Libyan people. We lose people every day for political cause, for reasons, for power, uh, for weapons everywhere. and. We can't, we can't change it in one day, I know that. But we can start with the change. And I hope that happens from, from, from today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Najla. That's a good note to, to end on. Um, now we've plenty of time to open it up to questions. Um, I know there's a roving mic that Ferdos has, but it's also not a terribly large room aside from the buzzing air conditioning. Uh, uh, Hamid Lelou, uh, operational culture analyst on Marine Corps University, but at this way I'm not here to present them. So can I start with three quick questions? Very quick, quick no ones. comments. <laughs> um, yeah. First one, um, great presentations for all of you. Uh, where do you put the Senussi Brotherhood and Haftar, General Haftar, in your security equation? You put that security equation there, but you didn't mention the Senussi and Haftar. Uh, number two, in your opinion, what would be the top three or five criteria when selecting new recruits to be trained in the US or in Europe? As you know, we have failed doing that, and we know that some of the recruits fled while being trained uh, in Poland and other countries. And lastly, um, in your analysis, you presented a comparison between the Salafiyya Jihadi and Salafiyya al ilmiya without naming them. What are the Salafiyya uh, Siyasiyya, like uh, the ones we have in Egypt with Noor? Mm -hmm. Are they playing politically or not? Thank you very much. Okay. Since we had three, we'll take one more question in this lot, and then we'll, we'll do some answers. It's OK. Hi, Doug Brooks. Um, uh, great presentations. My questions would be on the external actors. Who has the most influence uh, inside Libya uh, in terms of countries, in terms of um, groups, in, in terms of individuals? Um, who, uh, who is able to influence events inside uh, Libya from outside? Thank you for your questions. Uh, so concerning the Senussi Brotherhood um, role in the security equation, as far as I know, and I'm not sure about my info, but they don't play any security or pol political role anymore in Libya. They're more uh, a symbol rather than a real political security actor. And not it's been the case uh, since a very long time, since uh, Gaddafi came to power, where he uh, sought to actually destroy any reference to the past before Gaddafi didn't exist to Gaddafi. So, uh, concerning Haftar, actually, I th he's he's certainly playing a crucial security role uh, as he represents 
kind of the military wing in the eastern uh, in eastern Libya of this institu institutional conservative camp, and I think many of the eastern tribes are uh, are supporting Haftar, and he represents to a large extent his their only hope to try to counter the influence of. Uh, Brigades that are considered of being Islamist or backed by Misrata in the East. So, of course, he's playing a crucial role, especially that now he's benefiting from a kind of a legal uh, coverage uh, mandate with the House of Representatives naming uh, Al Nazuri, his chief of operations, as uh, as the new uh, Libyan Army Chief of Staff. So, um, yeah, he's certainly gaining. Uh, uh, political power and uh, but on the military front uh, well he's, he hasn't been very successful so, so far which creating a lot of doubts around his usefulness actually in, even among his, uh, his supporters so they might, might turn to uh, new, uh, new actors um, concerning a Salafia CSC uh, and the political Salafism it's it's very active in Libya, and they're playing uh, an important role. Notably, um, the former LIFG Libyan Islamic Fighting Group uh, members, uh, ha actually, who um, during the year 2000s um, renounced to jihadism and to political violence, and actually uh, espoused kind of a mainstream Islamist under the patronage um, at that time of Ali Salabi in Benghazi and with the support of, uh, of Qatar who tried to mediate and uh, help the mediation between former LIFG members and the Gaddafi regime. Um, they found a political party today and they're part of the political uh, game in Libya. And oh, yeah, so their former jihadists uh, converted into political activism actually. And unlike Hezb nur in Egypt, where, which comes from a more Kiatist school and moved into the political arena uh, following the Egyptian revolution. So, yeah. Maybe you want to answer the four or five uh, One thing that um, I might jump in on is talking about this issue of the criteria of selection of new recruits. Uh, and I think that's really important. But actually, I think what we need to do when we're talking about these issues of integration and new recruits is actually rewind <laughs> quite a bit. So before you can decide about what kind of recruits you want to select, you want to decide what kind of institutions, what kind of specialties you lack, what kind of specialties you need to develop, what kind of institutions you want to have, what style of police, or, or you know, are you going to reconstruct an intelligence service? Is that going to be entirely dismantled? These things haven't been properly mapped out, discussed, and this is what I was referring to earlier when I was talking about this need for a vision. A, tr a new vision for security and justice. And when you develop a plan about what institutions you're going to have, then you can talk about what kind of people are needed to be recruited into those kind of institutions. But another point that needs to be addressed, and I was sitting here drawing triangles, um, because this is what um, one of the, the Thawar did for me when I very first went to Libya, is, is that at the moment, you know, what they were talking about in terms of re recruitment is having all of the thawar go in here at the bottom, which is in ways important because there is a lack. There, we talked about this sort of inverted triangle, this top-heavy institutions with very uh, far more senior level generals and colonels than you have, you know, patrol officers. But at the same time, I mean, thawar aren't going to be happy to insert here at this level, unless they also are able to have some of their commanders at this level. It's just not going to work. And so, I mean, there, there have been some discussions, and I know that certain people who were involved at the upper, upper echelons of the SSC, for example, have had very complex conversations. But I don't think that there were ever good decisions about how you integrate, not just at this level, but also at this level. Um, another point on the integration piece um, is that, um, is that I think that, that um, going back to, to, to your point from earlier, um, it's not, um, I don't think it's even just about um, how, where, where, the dis, where the decisions for, uh, the incentives for integration. 
Um, there, it was not just about the incentives or who you need to incentivize, but also about like a, na a lack of planning and a lack of management of that of that integration process. And what's interesting is, it's not that integration has failed in all places. It's it, it's very context driven. And so, for example, in some towns where the chief of police maybe defected and became part of the revolution, well, then the revolutionaries are much more willing to join that police force because this guy is in charge that they believe in, that they want to work for, that they're happy to work for. They're less happy to work for an institution where you have an old Gaddafi guy coming back into his position as senior police, and then they're not willing to work with or for that person. Um, so I think that's interesting, and it was really interesting to interview um, cadets and senior police and former police at different levels about their feelings about integrate and it, it changed hugely from town to town and even within we with the the 2013 research we interviewed four different neighborhoods in Tripoli and it was vastly different in each one um, but um, another piece is to go back to sort of this incentives point as well um, uh, one of one of my favorite people, because he was so candid, that we interviewed was this border guard from Ismail. Uh, and I, uh, he 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 used to be a border guard under the Gaddafi regime. He's also a wildly active smuggler, um, but that that was fine. It was sort of at a permissive level. Um, but he joined during the revolution. He joined and, and subsequent to the revolution, he joined the Libya Shield. And I asked him, I was like, but I don't understand. You're you're acting as a border guard for the Libya Shield, but you were already a border guard. Like, why didn't you just go back to your old job? Why did you join the Libya Shield? And he's like, well, with the Shield, I get, you know, three days on, four days off. So that's a lot better. Uh, and I get paid more. So which would you choose? <laughs> you know? Exactly. It, it, I think it's been, there has been some attempts to balance that out. But, but I mean, that's, when you talk about incentives. And then the only thing I'll add to that sort of conversation is sort of particularly on training, developing that is, you know, a command and control issue that I think we highlighted. And so not just um, who are the individuals that we're recruiting, but um, who are they aligned to? And I think that there are a number of different issues at play in that simple question alone that are politically motivated, economic. I mean, it's, I think, the really tough nugget to crack. But I would say that without sort of having um, a knowledge of whether or not those recruits are actually going to go back and go under state command and control, there's a lot of potential harm to actually training them as well. About the uh, reintegration and disarmed uh, groups, I think, um, to be honest, the, the, uh, the responsibilities both from our government and also with the UN and the international organization who try to join them. Because we, as we mentioned, we, we don't have, we, we are now facing the attitude, we are dealing with lack of capacity with the people who are in charge. So I think at this point, those international organizations like the UN, when they come and they want to do the disarmed and the reintegration program, they just make it really in, in, in a way just find for alternative job for those people or pay money for them. And this is not, not, this is not the way how they can actually uh, you know, design the project. They use the advantage no people understand exactly or know exactly how that program should work and how they can deal with these groups. And I can't blame what happens now in Libya, like even just 20% of that, because the program wa was failure. And there was really short time process. They didn't work very intentionally with, the, with those uh, traumatized group. They didn't actually try to satisfy their needs. And then the, uh, what's, what was the solution? Uh, what was the consequences? They was like just having money and they should just try to run their you know, money and then just try to have salaries from the government to support those uh, different militia groups. So in, in the end, like Fiona mentioned, there is no loyalty to the, to the, to the people who are in charge. The loyalty will be all, always to the to the head of the commanders or to, to the militia because there's no actually process can really implement to those people or try can change or shift those people attitude so I think also there is there is really lack and there is of understanding I think we should go back and try to check some lessons learned have been done in the early days in Libya and how that really affect the consequences now so I hope that will open our minds and try to think about alternative ways to deal with that. 
and about the Libyan shield, like I just heard yesterday, like now they, they try to shift their, the way how they now control Benghazi. So they create the Shura Council in Benghazi, which is now uh, Ben Hamid and Zhawi, both of them. And they control now the city, but they know the, the people, they are not happy with them. So they don't want to, you know, announce themselves, you know, publicly everywhere. But also the city now is surrounded by the Jaish, those uh, Hefter uh, military. And now the people actually between both of them. And, 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 and even who was supporting the dignity in the beginning because they were thinking this is the only way to follow those militia, now they change their position because the circle of violence just continue every day. So what we should do, should we f keep fighting or engage those militia? Try to engage them and think about how we can sort that. Um, on the issue of external actors, we were kind of actually debating this over dinner last night. And I think, um, I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of di difficulties for everyone because, because access is so difficult at the moment. But N Naji had an opinion he might share. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's really hard to say. Many, many countries have a particular interest in Libya, but maybe you have the impression that we have two camps that are uh, emerging in the region on one side, Qatar and Turkey trying to support the so-called Islamist revolutionary camp. And, um, and on the other side, uh, Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, obsessed with the idea to counter an Islamist uh, influence uh, in the region, so backing the Zintani conservative uh, camp. Uh, Egypt and Algeria are allegedly, allegedly playing as well a role in, in Libya. They have uh, security concern, concer uh, concerns concerning the security situation in Libya. Um, on th at the international level, the uh, Great, Brit Great Britain seems to play uh, an important role and to engage with all parties. Uh, so, yeah, they have uh, a wide range of, of contacts and maybe to a lesser extent, but still very influential, the U.S. as well. Mm -hmm. French trying to, but... Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the Libyan diaspora? Mm, not as far as I as I know, uh, but <laughs> with the exception Maybe. of the ones in the room. <laughs> Let's uh, take a few more questions here. Uh, Ali, from you first. Ali Abu Ali Abu Zaku can member of the House of Representatives, the ones who are boycotting Tobruk. <laughs> no, I need to uh, really look, uh, first of all, thank you for wonderful presentations. Uh, you know, I live in Libya, so I see now how you look at Libya, this country that I live in, and how you analyze the situation of security and justice. I think uh, challenges are magnificent. I mean, in many ways, uh, we are facing a uh, problem of building the country from the very scratch. Institutions uh, are not there, so uh, arms are there. And, uh, you know, military uh, institutions or military <coughs> structure is completely uh, the outdated uh, regime. But in my uh, listening to some of the presentations, I like to challenge your, uh, you know, uh, claims that it is an Islamist versus conservatives. Mm. I don't think so. Libyans are all, you know, very conservative Muslims. You have to look at Libya this way. And the word Islamist means what? People who believe that Islam has a political role. All Libyans know and believe that they have, Islam has a political role. You might be, you know, alluding to the, the political party, for example, like uh, the construction uh, justice and construction party which is aligned with muslim brothers could be that's one but that's one point which we need to realize when we speak about libya we were speaking about a very conservative muslim society and then we can analyze the degrees of conservatism or islamism but it is not islamic versus conservative this is i think a notion that we need to revisit the other one is the use of the word jihadist. I'm really shocked because I'm a Western-educated Muslim. I'm Libyan. I lived here for so many years. 
Jihad itself is a wonderful concept. I think we are using those who are using arms and we are giving them a very beautiful concept, I mean, uh, no, I mean culture. We shouldn't be calling those who are resorting to arms as jihadists. They are, uh, you know, either criminals or uh, weapon uh, carriers, or whatever it is, call it anything, but not jihadists. This really a front for me and front for many Muslims who consider jihad as a beautiful thing that starts with the individual. But that is a problem of the Western culture when it deals with, the, with Libya. Again, Salafis. There are Salafis who are mudkhalis. The, that's, I think, uh, the question of our friend. Mudkhalis are Salafis who always uh, accept the ruler. And they do not uh, rebel against the ruler. Ba'at wali al-amr is for them paramount. So we have to differentiate between those kind of Salafis and the other Salafis who are part of the mainstream, uh, so to speak. Okay. The other point that I... One uh, more. One more. One more point. <laughs> Only one. And then yeah. we're going on to I, Najla, when you said that there are two millions in Tunisia and double of that in Egypt, well, who was living in Libya? Yeah. Libya only has six millions. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to... Just, I no, but I am, I, am, I, I am sure about this information because... Two millions in Tunisia two million and in double Tunisia. of them in Egypt? Two million in Tunisia. Just check the, the UN... Uh, the UN website in Tunisia about the displacement because I'm doing research about the the refugee now in Tunisia and uh, in Egypt. And next, yes. next question from Phil here. Bill Lawrence, um, I came late, so it sounds like you didn't. I mean, these will be useful questions, but if you already covered this. Um, don't feel like you have to repeat what you said. Um, first of all, let me echo a couple things Ali said. We, um, Two million in Libya, four million in Egypt, and you only have five and a half million Libyans. These numbers are way off, and they come from border crossings uh, that the Tunisian government talks about. Um, I think maybe we're talking about 800,000 Libyans in, in, uh, in, in Tunisia, maybe a few more. Now, that's massive, which gets me to my question on that point, which is if you have so many civil society activists on the outside and so many people in general on the outside, why not use that to your advantage? Why not start organizing the Libyan communities in Tunisia and Egypt to work proactively on a whole range of issues? You can put together working groups. You've got people from all the different sectors. So, so instead of lamenting why, um, justifiably, why you can't do things in Libya because of the security situation, if half your population is outside, then start now on the outside. Um, that's a question and a comment, I guess. Um, the, the, the next point is um, we used to talk in Middle East studies about the Islamic revival as a big thing and then Islamism as a subset of it and how the West didn't really get how. And whenever I see the data, famously the NDI poll last year where pretty much all of Libyans were for democracy and engagement with the West as a criteria for political parties and leaders and for Sharia and quite conservative social mores, you mean you really have as extreme a version as I've seen in any MENA country of a clash between um, uh, the Islamic revival, which is central to what's going on sociologically, and this Islamism piece, which has not been sorted out. And when you see this sort of the happiness in your polling about these committees, you know, that's right at the heart of what I'm talking about. So my question, and Ali might want to take the answer during, over lunch, if not now, I mean, my, my question is, who's going to take the leadership about separating between getting Islam right, right, and getting politics right? And now, now within Salafism, you have an effort. You have a separation from the Salafi, you know, the the Dawi Salafists, the Dawa Salafists, and the, which we've got into a little bit in this discussion. But but Libya, and again, this is a question comment. But Libya really needs some leadership now on getting Islam right separately from getting politics right. Um, I'll stop there. We have two more women from here. Again, from here. Hi. Um, asking this question from an international development perspective, which is, I know Najla talked about the, this, this group of, oh, sorry, this group of um, Libyans who are in Egypt and in Tunisia, and I know you mentioned that they are ready to be trained. So from, from an implementing partner perspective, what, what are the most important trainings to offer these individuals? And also in terms of in-country support and in-country training, 
what are what are the priority items that that you need training in or that people need access to? wanted to go back to the USID survey that you had referred to about, um, I think you had said 60% of Libyans were, had a tendency to this Sedefi, please correct my wording, the Sedefi um, ideology or... Right. <coughs> right. But I wanted to ask about... Um, when they ha asked those questions, did they also have follow-up questions? Because I would think um, the way it was described, I would uh, I would say that it was a little bit um, it can be a little bit deceiving as to uh, the picture that it gives uh, Western uh, supporters or populations. Um, because, for example, a lot of times if you ask them, should there be a moral police in the sense of uh, regulating alcohol and the dress code of, say, not necessarily not hijabi, but, you know, bikinis or something like that, most Libyans would say, oh, yeah, of course I support that. But they would not necessarily have a set of, I know I'm simplifying it a little bit, but not have set of tendencies overall. They Or um, very conservative tendencies. If you kind of... Um, investigated further, then they would disagree with a, a very conservative perspective. They would tell you, oh, no, no, we're just middle of the road. And they do believe in the um, individual freedom to a certain extent and those aspects. So I guess I'm asking about the USAID survey, not specifically that question, but overall, um, is there a possibility of getting that data? Is it published? And were there just general questions or were there follow-up questions? Because I also think experience with surveys is another thing. You know, in the West, we're, we take surveys all the time. But over there, you might ask them a survey question and they don't know necessarily that they can give you a little bit more or what exactly you're referring to or is it an overall question I can't go more into detail. No, that's great. What I'm going to demand from the panel is super, super fast answers, because there's a lot of hands up, and maybe we can do another round. <laughs> super fast answers to extremely complex questions. Maybe I'll start with Mr. Ali. Uh, actually, and the division between Islamist and anti-Islamist uh, spheres, and I do agree with you on the fact that it's not the only way to analyze the situation in Libya, but it is a dimension that is not to be uh, underestimated. We have political parties, uh, and we, when we talk about Islamism here, we're talking about political Islam and not Islam as a religion. So we're talking about people who are doing politics in the name uh, of Islam. Um, concerning the use of word jihadist, well, this is the common uh, scientific um, term. Whether so, it's, it wasn't my role today to uh, <laughs> review it. Can we take it down? We take it. <laughs> but of course we take it. Um, and a Salafi al madkhaliya that's true. Like Salafism is born with all the Madkhali Albani, uh, Albani schools, but they're not the only Salafi school. We have uh, political Salafism and jihadi Salafism, which is a kind of offshoot of uh, the uh, mother Salafism. Um, faster than that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, who is in charge of separ separating politics and religion? I, th I think there is a key point in Libya where there must be a way to prevent religious institutions from using the religious status to do political or, or to serve a political cause. And uh, there, there were propositions because the role of uh, the Mufti was, for in, in the point of view of some, a bit controversial as he was considered of siding with one camp uh, at the expense of uh, another one. And there were some propositions to make a, um, a collegial uh, uh, house of IFTA where the, where the uh, committee would represent uh, all the uh, trends that exist in Libya today, all the trends that are the Malikism, Salafism, uh, even uh, Ibadism, uh, in the Amazigh community. So it might prevent from using some religious institution uh, for political uh, purposes. Um, I don't, we can talk about it. What, what about using the diaspora? 
as well. Yeah. Um, do you want to answer the methodology question? Uh, yes, concerning the USID uh, survey, actually, you're, you're right. The, the question when it was isolated from the, the overall survey, which was uh, composed for 40 questions, could be misinterpreted. But if I allow myself to take it isolated from other questions, because we had other questions that confirmed a certain penetration of Saudi Salafi ideas within the Libyan society, notably due to a lot of TV channels actually broadcasting in, in Libya. I'm not saying, actually, up to only 30% of Libyans, according to the survey again, would define themselves as Salafi. Most of them would define themselves as Maliki. But that said, even within the Maliki uh, sphere, many of them would adhere to uh, Salafism not as a radical way of seeing Islam, more as uh, a way of conciliating moder modern way of living, like in Saudi Arabia and in the Gulf countries, and a certain Islamic identity. I think it's a more of an instinctive adhesion to Salafism than real ad adhesion to this way of practicing Islam. But in fact, they, there is a, like uh, an important addition to some Salafi ideas. Very, uh, yeah. So, I, unfortunately, not. <laughs> um, one one other point, just on on methodology, is we were with doing um, the perceptions study uh, on justice and security. We were really careful, especially with the 2013 one, to balance it um, quite actively with qualitative. Um, so we did the quant survey, but then we allowed the quantitative interviewing to sort of filter in and balance some of those answers. One in particular that was really, really almost a comical response was um, when asked in a survey, um, do you own a weapon? Uh, I can't remember the exact number because it's not, we didn't put it in this in the end, but it, it was like incredibly low. And then in our qualitative interviews, they would say no, and then you would sit for a minute and just look at them, and then they would go, well, I mean, there are those five AK-47s that we have, and we got. So it was it was really interesting because we could see how we got that yeah. sort of incorrect. Or I mean, to it be seemed like a yeah. skewed answer. The the better I think than the five AK-47s mm -hmm. was when somebody pulled an RPG shooter from behind the couch <laughs> in an interview. Yeah, I was interviewing um, them, and I think it was somewhere. It was around sort of a twenty percent um, response positive response rate to owning weapons. And yeah. so you can see sort of there are certain types of questions because technically owning a weapon in Libya is illegal, right? The Ministry of Interior has to provide licenses, and only sort of very under law, very specific subsets are allowed to own them. So there's you know, some understanding to how you get different answers. Um, I'll try to also go quickly, um, unless you had something else to add. Go. Oh, okay. So I, on the topic of that things can't be done in Libya, I want to apologize if we sort of gave that impression. I don't think we were trying to. I think that the international community in particular, um, you know, I know for us, like as USIP, right now there's just incredible limitations due to the um, insecurity. But a number of Libyans are still trying to rebuild their country, and I think that's an important message to sort of take into account. Um, while there are also a number that are sort of um, both displaced outside of Libya as well as displaced from their homes inside of Libya, um, there are a number that are staying in their communities and continuing to try to deal with the situation and build rule of law, um, build better governance. And so, you know, we've found sort of trying to camp come up with creative ways bringing them outside to do trainings, but not just sort of trying to give them technical skills and abilities, but working with um, people that have gone through similar situations. Um, my colleague in the back, Katam al um, she's been working on a lot of our programs in Iraq, and so what we've been trying to do is to build up relationships between our Iraqi partners and our Libyan partners to learn from one another and support one another, um, sort of coming up with those type of creative solutions. In terms of the type of sort of skills and um, needs in terms of trainings, I think that you can't underestimate the need for coaching and mentoring. Um, the revolution in Libya happened so fast that most civil society activists were not actively trying to operate in a conflict setting. And so I think that's also an important thing to keep in mind to what they're trying to do now is very different in terms of sort of their operating status than it was during the revolution. And trying to sort of build up their resiliency to that I think is also really, really critical. Um, but I'll stop there. Ejla. Three key skills. <laughs> uh, 
dialogue skills, mediation, and facilitation. Yeah. Three of them. From the government level to the civil society. Thank you very much. Um, my question has been very brief. I'm just wondering if anybody could speak to the uh, the talks on, on Monday and who, in fact, was talking to to, to whom, sorry. Uh, it's very unclear from the open source information. Uh, maybe Mr. Ali could, could help us in that regard. Uh, we understand that some members of the uh, the House of Representatives in Tobruk were talking to some of the misrought and elected members of the House of Representatives that had boycotted, or were they talking to members of the Tripoli-based GNC, or were they talking to any of the militia leaders? Uh, any clarity on that would be very appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you. Hi, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, in the, I asked this question to the to the folks at Carnegie um, as well when they had their conference. Um, given the expertise and skill set of the panel here, um, you know we're sitting in the the temple of of conflict resolution. Um, is there, you know, I don't. I guess is there a Gandhi option? Is for you know whatever the nuclear option is of peace. Um, is there anything that hasn't been tried? Are have has every resource been put to bear on Libya? Um, or is there a sort of level of escalation of engagement um, that has not been attempted based on you know, the best practices of your discipline, recognizing that you know, Colombia is not Libya um, and every child is special and every place is unique? Um, but is there anything else that should be done or could be done that we're holding in reserve? Thank you. We didn't get to. Thank you. My name is Sen Rolson. I'm a graduate student at the Georgetown University. Uh, I just had a question. You mentioned the, the Salafi jihadists and the rise of, of those, and you qualified it would be that they were quite local. Uh, yeah, it was, is, there, is there any noise of the southern-based kind of international jihadi Salafists, like the kind of the, the people who went over from Mali? Uh, if you could comment on that, it would be. Okay. Does anybody want to jump in on what happened yesterday? I'll And and just to give you example. Uh, when you wonder, is there a Gandhi? Actually, we have we need leader, we re real leadership in Libya, and this is one of the things really, uh, you know, the reason we will have this struggling and this crisis. But I, I just I want to mention to you when I before I came here and study the peace studies conflict transformation, I was activist. I was working there since 2011. But if you if you if I'm gonna tell you what kind of information and knowledge I gained when I came here and know about all these strategies, uh, strategies included nonviolent movement, for example, and how to be create good leaders, or how to support or coaching or all that stuff. I was hoping if I, I, I knew all this information before, since the revolution started. So this is just small example, shows how the education, the awareness is very important in our context. And, and, and in this way, we can create, I mean, definitely the leadership is one of the gifts in any, any society, but how that leader can really push and try to create change without people aware or educated about what he's doing exactly, to believe in that message and support it. Um, I don't have an answer to question number one. Um, but also, um, I think in term, I definitely do not think that we have put um, we being collectively both Libyans and internationals trying to build peace um, with Libyans, sort of done ev every option. I think that, um, and I'll, I can say this honestly, sort of going into Libya in 2001, or 2001, 2011, um, I think that there so were, were <laughs> no, <laughs> never, um, sort of there was a lot of assumptions that were made that sort of likely ended up turning out false. Um, and I think that we're still sort of learning and uncovering what a number of those are. I think, like um, Nejla said, there are things, you know, 
you can't underestimate the amount of sort of knowledge, skills, and enhancing abilities that can be done in Libya. And then the one thing I also don't think either Libyans or the international community has done well enough is actually creating linkages among civil society, local government, and others around Libya. Not sort of, I think a lot of the focus had been on creating the linkages between the central government and the communities, but not among the communities to be a resilience against sort of the use of um, force as sort of a political um, agenda item. And so I think that there are a number of things that can still be tried um, to develop that type of sort of resilience and peace. Uh, yes, I think Mr. Ali is better entitled to answer the question on uh, what happened yesterday in, in Gadamis and who participated. Maybe you'd like to, to answer. Yeah. 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 I said members from uh, the uh, House of Representatives in Tobruk with members uh, who are boycotting uh, the sessions in Tobruk. Only those, only the two sides who met in the dams yesterday. Crystal ball here. It's great. Uh, maybe. Uh, Some, some spokesmen of military brigades and some Islamist figures uh, did boycott, actually, the, uh, the, the conference and the talks, yeah. Um, concerning the jihadist Salafi presence in, in southern Libya, uh, it's true that maybe we have a higher uh, proportion of foreign uh, elements in southern Libya, unlike maybe the eastern Libya or Western Libya, where you have few uh, Tunisian elements. But uh, in Southern Libya, the situation appears to be different. However, their presence is important because they are trying to take uh, benefit from intertribal divisions. And they're allying themselves with some local groups, which, allow, which is allowing them to, to be present. Otherwise, there, in, in, in many cases, it's, it's ex exaggerated the, um, the presence of jihadist Salafi group uh, in, in southern Libya, it's mainly internal dynamics. And they're not the only foreigners actually present in southern Libya. We have a lot of groups uh, present in, in southern Libya today. So. Um, I'm, <laughs> um, I'm just going to um, say a final word as faux moderator on, um, on, on Mr. Dietrich's point. Um, one thought, and again, not to treat cases as, as generalizable, or, or one point of inspiration for me, having been able to travel actually back to my own country and talk about some of the conflict resolution issues in Northern Ireland, is, is some of the methods that were used in that case um, for this. One thing that, that strikes me and has struck me all along about um, the political deadlock in Libya is that it, it, it might be served well by breaking up some of those political deadlock issues into smaller pieces and dealing them with them in, in, in committee pieces with, like they did in Northern Ireland, a theoretically neutral arbiter and the, a, a neutral arbiter that also engages in their own both local and international empirical research on how to design a new, a, a new institution, how to redesign and how to, to rehaul institutions. Because um, one thing that I think you know, we haven't mentioned, and I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm reticent to say it because I don't want to jinx it, and I'm sure that it won't come to anything because you know you get a bit jaded on these points. But the C60, you know, they're still talking and still moving, as far as I understand, forward. And so maybe that's one example of a, a, the, the Committee on 60 on the Constitution. So if if, if they if they were able to break that piece for the moment, look, if they don't solve the political issue that whatever solution they come up with won't mean anything. But at the same time, being able to break that off and to deal with it in a more specialized environment is potentially maybe a way to, to move things forward by breaking it down. Um, but I think we have to wrap up there. Uh, thank you very much for coming along. Um, I understand that USIP is, is doing some rethinking on events. So there's some one of these under each of your chair, I think, uh, if you, or, or the back. Um, um, and then the Libya Working Group for members who are here is going to convene in the next um, a, a room just down the hall. Thanks very much for coming.